coming up on today's episode of the Salesman Podcast. Uh, sales is sales and, and the, the easiest way to add value is to send us a customer or to send us a lead. Hello, Sales Nation. I'm Will Barron, host of the Sales and Podcast, and welcome to today's episode. On today's show, we have Mark Tanner, co-founder of Quilla. And Quilla is a hot tech startup based out of Australia. And that is exactly what we're diving into today. Tech startup sales roles are particularly lucrative and they're particularly hard to come by. And so we're diving into exactly what Mark, as a co-founder, looks for in a sales professional. You can find out more about Mark and Quilla over at quilla.com. And with that all said, Let's jump into today's show. Hey, Mark, and welcome to the Salesman Podcast. Thanks, Will. Great to be here. You're more than welcome, sir. So I've had quite a few people come on the show recently, and this has led to a mountain of email from uh, Sales Nation listening to this, which is fine. And I'm happy to go through these emails and go back to them. But essentially, quite a few people come on the show and said, if you're looking for the, the ultimate sales position uh, from a financial perspective, from perhaps a lifestyle perspective, from just having a, a cool job and being involved with cool people in a, a fast-paced industry, uh, SaaS technology, B2B sales is where it is at. Now, I'm getting loads of emails every day saying, what company should I go for? Should I be sending my resume? Should I, should be, should I be building an online footprint if this is a, a tech online company? And so I've got loads of questions to essentially refer here to you, Mark, um, as the the kind of CEO, the the COO, sorry, the the sales lead over at Quilla, I'm sure you'll be able to. Well, you you'll hopefully be able to really practically answer a lot of these questions, and there'll be a lot of value in this episode for anyone who is looking to move into that market. Now, the first one, and where I want to start with this is, uh, and the answer is probably it depends. But what the most common question I get asked is on the job listing or, or wherever this this job lead has come up, the question uh, or the, the statement has always said, we want someone who has SaaS uh, B2B sales experience. Now, when that is written down, is that 100%? Is that you've got no chance without that? Or is this kind of negotiable if you're the right person? I mean, it depends. <laughs> um, no, I think the... the, the in all these situations, everything, especially in sales, things are flexible. I mean, a good salesperson and someone who has you know, a great relationship with customers and has that empathy and the ability to sell, you're always going to be open to working with them. I mean, there are some really special salespeople out there and it doesn't really matter what they've done. Um, I think the, the, the adding the adding lines like that to job postings, which I myself am very guilty of, is a massive crutch and it should be viewed as like, you know, a bit of BS, to be honest. I think that, you know, if you come into that scenario and you've done X years of experience at a really great company, yeah, that's going to help you a lot. But it's not something that, that should be a hard and fast requirement. It is, you know, at the end of the day, human beings learn and adapt and do new things. And I think there's often a lot of benefit in taking people who have skill sets in other industries who might be, do you know what, like SaaS B2B people, like some of them have some really great strengths in some areas, not so good in others. I think like outbound is an area that is like, and especially like, you know, larger, if you have a business that's starting to move up to mid-market and enterprise, that's an area where, yeah, there are some companies like Salesforce that have a lot of experience there but not too many. So I think there's, you know, always there's uh, plenty of room for anybody to come in. Cool. Well, taking uh, perhaps a step back or a step sideways from that topic as well, something that get, gets asked to me is, should I choose a company and pitch myself and sell myself to them, knowing that they are you know, a capable salesperson that is probably, uh, is probably 99% of the time going to be an asset to that company? Or should they hold fire and just wait uh, patiently, <laughs> as patiently as they can, for that job opening to to come about. I mean, how how approachable are you if a, a talented salesperson was to email you, cold email you, asking? I, well, th that's another conversation as well. Asking for a job versus kind of just building relationship. Uh, but on the surface level of this, um, Mark, should we be pitching you, or should we be waiting for jobs? Oh no, no, pitching for sure. Definitely, a hundred percent. And I think the pitch, you you sort of said it. You sort of said it right. Like the pitch is is, it shouldn't be, a pitch that, 
I need a job tomorrow because you're probably not going to find that. Um, you know, I think that's a bit of a different thing. When you say build a relationship, that's completely correct. You know, I think one of the biggest things of advice I have for friends who are interested in joining startups and, and doing interesting things like that is saying, well, go out and look at look at the startups. It's never been easier to figure out like what interesting companies there are, what spaces do you like, who do you think is actually growing well, who seems to have an interesting company culture or seems to have a chance to become, you know, a billion dollar business or, you know, whatever size you're looking for. And you should reach out to them and say, you know, you shouldn't be expecting a job, you know, today. But if you can add value to them, if you can, I'm a big believer in give before you get. So if you can help them out a little bit, do something that that could, you know, be useful to them, you know, maybe this is a startup that is, uh, you know, being very successful in the US and they've raised 10, 20 million dollars, but they don't have an office in the UK or in Australia or in Japan yet, or in, or you know that they're doing great stuff, but they're all out of San Fran. They don't have anybody on the East Coast. Reach out and say, hey, look, whenever you're ready, I'd be happy to, you know, help out or do some scouting for you or, you know, whatever it is. And I think people, you know, people take that seriously. The worst thing that happens, by and large, when you put out a job ad for a a salesperson is you just get blasted with so many CVs and they, they don't care about your company. They don't care about your mission, the thing you're working hard on, the thing you have given up a hell of a lot for that you are really, you know, that you've really toiled for. They don't really care. They don't write a cover letter. They don't really try at all. And I think the people who reach out early, who know your product, who know what you're about, at least a little bit, um, and take it seriously. That's so flattering and people will remember that and have, it has, you know, definitely has a big impact. And that's sort of how one of our earliest salespeople came about was because they had been introduced to us by someone who started that exact process. Well, let's get real practical about this, Mark, because I don't want to gloss over this. You said the words add value. Uh, and then you mentioned about uh, potentially scouting for new business, helping out. What what would really add value to you personally for someone, you know, perhaps here in the UK who wants to extend your reach over here, what would they do or what could they do to really add value to you before they kind of pitch themselves as I'm your next greatest salesperson? Yeah. So look, I mean, uh, sales is sales and, and the, the easiest way to add value is to send us a customer or to send us a lead, right? I mean, that's the the simple thing. You know, we work with a bunch of businesses. We have, you know, it's you know that that's what our you know our business is that's what the job is to a degree is to you know find people and you say look i've used your product i love it i think it's fantastic i've referred these companies to you they should be signing up uh you know if they if they do you know you know say you know say hi from me or or whatever and that's our first person you know again that that story our first person who did that a sent some customers our way and then b was very happy to go for a beer to talk about what we're talking about to talk about how you should think about hiring in a in a for a startup and and what sort of matters and they'd been through uh, a few startups that had had a you know not not the best hiring practices and sort of had a few things that can go wrong and I think that's something you know everyone needs to be aware of like startups are messy and not you know they're very much imperfect and um, you know to some degree there are you know there are there are nice things about being in a big sales org um, but I think there's nothing better than being, you know, being an exciting, you know, sales growth on that side. But so, yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's a, a really simple way is to sort of, you know, talk about that, think about who their customers are and try and refer a couple of customers. It doesn't have to be perfect. You don't have to close a huge sale, but just that little bit of help and, and being open for a conversation is incredibly useful. Nice. Well, I know if I got an email, if I was a hiring sales manager, COO, whatever it is, and it was, Hey, I've just got you these free leads. One of them's really hot. I'd, I'd be open arms kind of taking them out for beer. You've turned the whole conversation on its head then, which is obviously then incredibly powerful. You're, you're, you're writing your own story versus kind of fitting in with someone else's, which leads me to this next point. And I'm, I'm genuinely intrigued to get your thoughts on this. For the the salesperson who perhaps they've done that, perhaps they've come in and there's a mound of CVs in front of you, and we'll get into CVs and cover that as a stuff in a minute, um, and they may not be perhaps as relevant as what the audience think they are, but you clearly are going to Google that person. What do you, ex- let's start the way around. 
what do you not expect to see when you Google a potential like, sales candidate to bring someone on board? Um, what do I not expect to see? I mean, I think the, I mean, sadly, the thing I don't expect to see is I don't expect to see anything much past a LinkedIn profile, right? I mean, I think that if you're looking at people people in marketing and people in product and people in that sort of area and design and whatever else, they all have blogs and they all have little sites that they've designed to make it look as impressive as they can. LinkedIn is not the most impressive looking, beautiful website of all time. It's fine and it serves a purpose and that's like totally like great, but it's, but it is something that, you know, you don't, you don't see uh, stuff out there that is, different. You know, everybody has a LinkedIn page. Uh, if you can do a little bit to differentiate yourself, that's sort of something that I think is, you know, very interesting and doesn't, you don't have to be blogging every week. You don't have to have to do that much, but if you just have a little page that just shows off who you are, what you care about and what, what's been interesting and that can kind of be it. It's at least you've done something a little bit different. Um, so I hope that's an okay answer. <laughs> yeah, I mean, what I, you took it a different angle though. What I was going at was uh, you don't expect to see drunken pictures of them on Facebook that's all viewable. Um, and you, you've given a more that's, intelligent answer than that, really. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think that's true. I mean, I think uh, to some degree, I suppose the point there is, is that that's none of my business. And I don't care if you get drunk on the weekend and have a great time. You're right. You're right that it, you're right that it shouldn't be public. Do you care on I'm a not... deeper level though? Like, would that affect your decision even if you were like, well, okay, they do whatever they want in the spare time, but would that still leave a, a, a dirty, a, a not nice taste in your mouth? Well, the only thing I'd say is, is that I don't care um, at all, but part of me would worry that our customers would care, right? And our customers are going to Google you too. You're going to be emailing with them or chatting or Skyping or demoing or doing calls or instant messaging or whatever. And they're going to find your name and find match it with our company name and, and find you and search for you. And if there's a bunch of dubious things there, that's, that's not what you want. So I think it wouldn't be a deal breaker for me, but I'd say, Hey, <laughs> put that stuff away, make that private before you go on there. It does, it does speak a little bit to judgment, but if you're hiring someone into a junior sales position and they're 21, 22 and are like hungry and, and really want it, you can't, you know, not everybody is a complete angel and I don't think you should be too naive, but um, yeah, it's something you have to, you know, look at them and make it, make a judgment call. Nice. I appreciate that because other people would give a blanket answer of no, that would just take them away from the, the decision-making process. But yeah, you're right. You could, you, and no one's ever said this before to me. It's very, if, if they're the right person, it's very easy to say, hey, you need to just change this two settings in Facebook and then all that disappears, that problem goes away. Uh, so I appreciate that, Mark. And taking this one step further, because um, this is where I see sales going. You can tell me if you agree on this or not. But if you are hiring a, a B2B sales professional, perhaps not in an entry-level role, perhaps they're more tenured, perhaps they've got, you know, you're, you want to hire someone who's an expert in the industry. Would it be a, uh, would you see it as a huge, big deal and, and, a, and, a, and a great kind of leverage point if they had perhaps a personal blog that did uh, pitch them as a thought leader in the industry on like a, a small scale in that they are interviewing buyers or they are interviewing other thought leaders or they are you know spending time at events and conferences and kind of blogging about that is that would that be a big deal and a big plus to you yeah for sure i mean i think that look as with everything right it depends if the content on there is terrible and feels anathema to what i believe and all that sort of stuff that's going to be a bit different but i and i would certainly say if you do this you really don't have to worry about quantity you don't have to do endless amounts of this all the time. But if you do think to yourself, do you know what, the way that, uh, you know, the industry is going in this type of, in this type of sales or, or the, the fact that are, you know, that buyers today are so educated that they can do stuff like they can now Google the salesperson. Like that isn't, that is a new thing. I mean, it's been around for the last five years, but it does have implications. Like what does that mean for the salesperson? You could definitely do a thoughtful post on that. And if I saw five or six thoughtful posts about topics like that, just thinking about it and caring about your craft, there is, you know, I think there are some salespeople out there who don't, you know, not that really that passionate about sales. 
Like they are sort of viewing it as a stepping stone, something else. I'd say that's most salespeople. Probably not yeah, the people I, who I are going to listen to a go out the way to listen to a podcast on it. So props, not this audience. But I think you're spot no, on. Sure. No, no, for sure. And I, I think that's that's totally true. And I think if you can show that you're interested in learning and trying to make yourself better and are being thoughtful about stuff, wow! Like that's you know that's exactly what you want. Of course, you want to work with those people. You want to have that situation where you can you know, go for lunch or go for beers and have a chat and say, you know, start talking about it. And they can be like, well, do you know what? The way we approach this problem is I think we actually should change this thing or we should change this system or why are we treating our customers like this? And if you can just show a couple of articles on that sort of front, um, you know, that's that'd be awesome. I mean, really, really impressive. Nice. I think what the 10 to 20,000 people listening to this show should probably do is start a small blog, get some content on there, and then uh, raise, rant and rave about how good the Salesman podcast is and what you've learned from each episode. Uh, and, and, and lots share of the, backlink. Yeah, lots of yeah. backlink. <laughs> share, share the content with all of your uh, peers as well. Uh, but no, joking aside, I think that you're spot on there. I think that the setting up this kind of one, uh, one mini site with, say, five evergreen blog posts of what you your even thoughts and philosophies around sales perhaps they won't match up with everyone and that's almost a pre-qualifier as to whether you're going to get on with that sales manager and their philosophy uh, and there's there's probably a lot more to go out with this uh, as a it could be a conversation in itself but i think uh, i know from personally i know from speaking with recruiters and that as well and clearly your your thoughts on this resonate more than the recruiters even the you know even more than them in that, you know, if there's context there, is that the right way to describe it? Context makes the decision uh, an easier one. And that leads us to CVs, uh, resumes for everyone in the States and um, cover letters. How important are these? And, you know, when you are hiring, is it literally, as I, as I imagine it, you get either an email system with uh, 30 of them on an email, they all look very similar and you're looking for mistakes to just filter them out. Uh, slash the kind of idea, the classic idea of you get a mound of pieces of paper dropped on your desk and you you got to spend the next week going through them. Is it is that the reality to this? I mean, thirty would be a dream. It's it's fifty to a hundred to more. It's um, it's never been easy to spam out your resume. Um, it's never been easier to just send out stuff and 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 uh, and do it quickly. And it's that's why it's uh. It, People are trying to do more and more of looking for people they want to work with and hire and building relationship beforehand um, rather than just putting up a, a job ad and, and getting flooded because it is a flood and it takes so much time to filter through it. And that is, again, to tack back to our earlier points, why if you do have a relationship, you know, part of me thinks if I know someone who I know will be good, you know, maybe if I advertise for it, I could find someone five to 10% better. But that's the amount of time I have to spend on that process and money on job ads and potentially a recruiter and whatever else, if I already know that you're going to be great, you know, maybe there's someone who's a tiny bit greater, but like really and truly, let's just, let's get to work. Let's do it. Let's start selling. Um, and I think that, uh, yeah, so I think as far as CVs and cover letters go, CVs, they're not useless. Um, they, they really do have a purpose, but it, it, they can be useless if, if used improperly. I think so many CVs look the same, say the same things, and really and truly you could, you could I mean, I, I must say I do love Americans. American, in America, there's this sort of rule or expectation that your CV will be one page. Sometimes you get these CVs in like font size eight because <laughs> they, they've still jammed it all in. But, um, you know, the CV should be one page. And that's maximum, you know, you don't, you know, really what the CV's job is like the job. And I'm a, as a side note, I'm a huge fan of the philosophy of jobs to be done, but the job that a CV is doing is to make me interested in having a chat with you. That's all its job is. You, I, I'm not going to hire you based off the CV. This is just to make me chat to you. And so you've got to show a couple of things there that are worthwhile, but really the most underutilized thing and it's so old fashioned, but the cover letter is so critical because a CV and a short note tells me you have no idea what my company does. You might not care what our product is, who our customers are, how they're going to interact with you, what you're going to be doing day to day. Uh, doing, a sh like doing some research and spending some time 
um, and making something that's quality and sending that across to us. So for those who don't know, Quiller is a tool that allows you to build your like sales and marketing collateral as web pages. And it's awesome and great and you should all check it out. But one of the things that we do is, you know, when we hire, some percentage of people will be like, oh, I'll make my application as a Quiller page. I'm going to send them this beautiful web page made with their software. Yes, you get treated more seriously. Like, of course you do. Because you've put time and effort in, you've learned a bit of our system, you've, especially if you've made it look nice and you've design, done some nice design, you know, it's a web page. You can, if you've done some cool stuff, like maybe you've embedded a little video, you know, just a simple little video like we're recording here, that's awesome. And I think that all of those sorts of things that show that you care, that show that you understand what's going on are so much more powerful. Um, but, but really and truly, you know, the CV uh, is... I mean, yes, I'll be interested if you've done a couple of things here and there, um, but really it's a, it's about getting you to the next stage. And, and so you shouldn't, you know, and the best way to do that is through a great cover letter or just a just a great email that introduces who you are and, and what you do and why you care about our company. Well, let's get real practical about this. You've given us some like food for thought, but what or if, has anyone sent you a cover letter that really blew you away and what was in there? And and perhaps we can talk about video as well because I think this is massively underutilized in sales as a as a prospecting tool, uh, helping with job searches. The video has such an impact that I feel like we we can't just gloss over that either. Yeah. So we had, I mean, so our last, our most recent hire um, uh, was one who you know who who just it just was very simple. Just just got in and and wrote a, you know, just again, using Quiller, just made a very simple, but just really elegantly, thoughtfully designed um, piece that that then not only talked about what they'd done, but talked about it in the context of what we were trying to hire for. So yes, it it sort of did the job of a CV. It sort of showed off jobs that he had had and, and things that he'd done, but everything was written just for Quiller. You could tell he couldn't reuse this stuff for some other job. You know, he was thinking that because you guys are working in a B2B, in a SaaS environment, here's how I've done things like that. Because you have to work, you know, whereas we're still a small and growing company, he knows that we have to, everyone has to wear many hats and he sort of expresses interest in the product and this and that. And is Um, is that the formula, Mark, of uh, you do this, so I do that. You do this, I do that. Is that the, if we were going to like kind of like mathematize it is that the way we'd go about it yeah i mean i think the way to think about it is is in that framework is a cv in a traditional sense is designed for a lot of people it's designed as a generic way to show off who you are and that's the same with linkedin right like i'm on linkedin i'm trying to give you a brief understanding of my background so that you know the hundreds of people who view me over whatever period of time can all can all get a taste that's that's not selling we all know that's not what selling. Like selling is about being specific to the problem that your customer has. I am your customer. I am you. You have to sell to me. Don't send me the same thing you save sell to everyone everyone else. You know that's that's marketing and that's crap marketing. <laughs> like, give me something that is tailored to me that understands my problem and that gives, you know, sells what you have, the features and benefits that come with you, in a way that is you know targeted for my needs. And, you know, that's really, you know, if you, you know, if you can do that well, just in the nature of that, you've already shown that you've got that sort of sales instinct. And I think that's just such a nice way to differentiate yourself. And then the other side is, I mean, it's sort of like um, a friend of mine's an academic and marks university, you know, undergrad university papers all the time. And the amount of joy we both get when you see something that's just a bit different, that someone has just taken the time to do things a little differently, uh, you just can't help but want to reward them. So even if you don't give them the job, you might say, oh, well, I know this great company's hiring. You should go check them out or something like that. So the effort never goes unrewarded. Let's go to video. Should we... I'm just grabbing my phone for everyone listening to the audio side of this. Should we be doing videos like this, selfie style? Should it be a phone on the table recording ourselves essentially reiterating what's in the cover letter itself. Do we need to up the production value of these and use a proper camera, decent lighting, like what we've got here in the studio? Or you know, what do you expect? And what would, because a video is more risky uh, and obviously there's more reward that comes with it as well, perhaps. But what do you expect from a video? What's the minimum requirements? 
I mean, I think the thing that you expect from a video, so I don't think I would use a, a, a cell phone. I would use a, a computer like we're using right now. Um, the the thing that that I've seen that works quite well is uh, you, videos shouldn't be too long, you know, just short and sharp. And and the great thing is all computers come with some degree of editing suite and just do that little bit of editing to it just at the start and at the end and maybe removing a couple of little things just to tighten it up. It's very easy to learn. Go on YouTube, spend, you know, an hour or two. Um, but But I think that video just as a way to introduce who you are, how you talk, uh, your general presence. You know, a lot of sales today is inside sales, right? And it's, it's, it's on chat and it's on email and whatever else. But the art of communicating through speech is still so critical to, you know, who, who we are and what we do and, and how we, you know, convey empathy to a customer and convey trustworthiness and interests and, and everything else. And, and, you know, genuinely. And I think, um, just being able to show that and just show a bit of enthusiasm and, and have the confidence to do it because it is, you know, it's something that's a little, again, it's, it's all these things are things of differentiating yourself, but video is, yeah, video is very powerful. And I think, you know, again, if you can use a tool um, like Quilla to, to embed a video and show that off, it's just another sort of way of, of differentiating how you do it. And we have companies who use this, whose sales teams use this. It's less so for the standard, you know, churn, sales and more for the, the bigger ones where it's like, you know, it, you're working on a special deal or it's the BD team or whatever else. And they're talking through specific problems, but they use it and they put it front and center. It's usually, you know, the, the, the equivalent of the third or fourth slide um, to really sort of get into it. And it has, and if you use tools like Wistia, which is a fantastic platform for tracking, are they actually watching the video? <laughs> if they are, when do they drop off? What sections they really like, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, uh, you can really get some great insights back as well. Definitely. Well, that's well worth diving into. We'll link to Wistia in the uh, show notes as well because clearly, uh, well, using Qu- Quilla, using other platforms, you can you can track when things are opened. And that is the, the biggest insight that you have of if something gets opened once, then a week later it's opened 15 times, you know that you're probably in a position where you should follow up right that second while you're front of mind. And, uh, you know, sales-wise, recruiting-wise, uh, or job search wise, that's, you know, that's when you've got that spike of attention. That's when you can really have an impact. And with that, Mark, I appreciate that, mate. You've given us lots of insights here, lots of practical, actionable things to go at. And I've got a couple of questions I ask everyone that comes on the show. These are quick fire to an extent of, you can probably answer them with uh, a, a, a sentence at max, but feel free to dive into it deeper if you feel like there's, there's value in there. And the first one, which do you prefer, basketball or rugby? Oh, I love basketball. That's a bit of a confusing one. My my 18 year old self is very angry right now. I used to love rugby so much. I still love the Wallabies. They're probably, for those who don't who can't tell, I'm an Aussie, and uh, I still get more emotional watching the Wallabies play uh, England or uh, or any sort of uh, you know European team than I or the New Zealanders. God. But um, uh, but I think that I think that um, but basketball. So I had the great pleasure of um, working for a few years in New York for Google on their their BD and sales team, and uh, I just got into the NBA, and the NBA is so much fun. Um, so yeah, that's my answer. Sorry, too long. No, not at all. Uh, clearly, there was some Twitter stalking that went into <laughs> to went into that question. <laughs> uh, but I'm a huge fan of basketball as well. Um, so yeah, I appreciate that. Next one, dollar size if possible. What's the biggest deal you've ever closed? Ooh, um, so uh, when I was at Google, I was working on Android, doing media and um, other related partnerships in Australia and the US. Um, so those deals were kind of complicated because you know you're you're doing a deal to bring on. Uh, so let's say we're doing a deal with News Corp to sell all their newspapers and magazines across Australia and New Zealand um, across like a, a three year term. So that's sort of a hard thing to like put a price on. But I mean, I think the the thing I would say is that, I mean, we definitely had had customers that we were working on that were expecting, in, you know, in the eight figure annual sales through those platforms of which, you know, Google was 
this is not giving anything away, but Google, the traditional amount that Google takes in that sort of scenario is um, in the 30% range. Uh, and so those, you know, deals like that, uh, of that sort of order were, were sort of the, the uh, are, you know, my bread and butter for a while. So whether it was in the millions or low tens of millions, something like that, but that's the amazing power of Google, right? I mean, those sort of things were, you can't claim, you can't claim too much credit when you have a product as explosive as Android and uh, a user base so huge. And then, you know, you get to go around with this amazing product and, there are some times in life that the product does sell itself. And I remember walking into these places with the charts of how many Android phones had sold in the last month. And they just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And eventually, you know, everyone was all focused on the iPhone and everything else, but eventually Android won the day. Nice. Okay, next one. Uh, other than Quilla, what is one book or resource that you'd recommend to the sales and podcast audience? Ooh, okay. Um, so a, a resource that I've been finding like just absolutely fascinating of, of late is a framework called Jobs to be Done. Um, this was originated by a guy called um, Clay Christensen. He is the guy behind the innovator's dilemma and the innovator's solution. So like that whole theory of disruption. So every time everyone uses that word, which has become massively overused, um, it's all tacking back to him. And he's an amazing academic. He's a professor at, at Harvard University in, in their MBA school. Um, the job to be done, there's a great video about milkshakes. Go and watch it. It's like five minutes long. You'll find it on YouTube. It explains it a lot. Um, there's a lot of great content online about this and blog posts. Um, the, but it, the, the, at its core, the way to think about it is everything that we do in life is every product, someone is actively hiring that product to do a job. And if you start to think about things from that perspective, not always, but a lot of the time, the, the steps you should take become incredibly clear. Um, in marketing, there used to be a thing for a while where you'd have personas and you'd say, we are selling to, you know, suburban mums aged, you know, 40 to 50 and da, da, da. And that was kind of a useful framework. But if you actually start to sort of step back and say, what am I actually selling here? And what is the job that it does for the customers? Maybe generally, but then also in this specific case, it's just like opened my eyes to a whole new range of possibilities. So I think that that is a really interesting and, and fundamental shift. So I would strongly encourage jobs to be done. And if you just watch the fun five minute milkshake video one, I think you'll you'll get, get some of the core concepts. Nice, we'll link to that in the show notes over at salesman.red. It seems like by doing that and coming up with a job first, you can reverse engineer the messaging without having to test the messaging to find out what the job is, if that makes sense. Uh, it seems like a, it seems like a, a counterintuitive, but perhaps uh, more ascertainable in the, the short term to source out the messaging, which is clearly important in sales. Next one, Mark, who is the world's greatest salesperson? Yeah, I mean, I, I, I have been, um, that's a fantastic question. I've been reflecting on this of late um, in a, a sense of how, because of the amazing circus that is the US election, uh, how you know politicians act as salespeople. And I've just been thinking of how they present themselves and the way they try to sell and the messaging strategies that they use. Um, I do not think either of the current candidates would fit into the, 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 top, the top thing there, but I have been sort of thinking a little bit about how people take messages and are able to build these movements behind them. And I thought the way you know, interestingly, the way that, you know, Bernie Sanders went about his one, the way Obama back in 2008 went about his campaign. If you look back to some of the ones, Bobby Kennedy's campaign before he was assassinated, I mean, just these amazing movement politicians, Martin Luther King. I mean, it's just there. I, I find that people who are able and they're sort of doing these sales at at an individual level. Um, but they're also doing it at this sort of massive group level. And I think that they are really fascinating and enacting, you know, is there anything bigger in sales than sort of enacting sort of massive social change and changing millions of people's minds about things? So look, that's a bit of a random answer, but that's something I've been thinking of, of late. Yeah, not random at all. Um, it comes up all the time on the show. And I, I agree with you, selling something that's intangible selling something to people who deep down know that you're only actually going to do half of what you say you're going to do as well so there's trust <laughs> issues there it is interesting and then i think a lot of people listening to the show 
if they pondered on it, they could probably find some insights in that most of the time they probably have one real big competitor that they're going up against. And as long as they don't screw up, it's going to be either them or the competitor that's going to get the business versus all the people further down the list, which is essentially uh, politics in most countries. I don't know about Australia, but in the UK, it's the same. You know, the three parties, only two of them are ever going to be big enough to get into power. And so there's there's lots of insights there. And um, and yeah, I think there's a blog post in there for us as well to dive into it deeper. And with Mark, I've got one final question to ask everyone that comes on the show. And that is, if you could go back in time and speak to your younger self, what would be the one piece of advice you'd give him to help him become better at selling? Uh, so I was um, I was very lucky that I had, so I uh, my first real job out of university was working for an ebook startup. Um, and they didn't have anybody doing sales really, and they desperately needed some someone. And I just ended up taking that role. And it, the only thing I would have told myself is, it, it, oh, like it was those early cold calls were so painful and were so hard. And I did so as few of them as I possibly could. But the skills that I built up in that job about being able to this no-name startup to get meetings with big media companies and, and other things like that. All those skills were what ended up landing me my job at Google, ended up making me really good at that job because if you can get someone on the phone from a startup, you can get anyone on the phone when you say you're from Google. Like, I mean, anybody at all. And I think that just telling my younger self that just to keep going. It is it is a slog, some of those early things, especially when you're working with someone with someone new and, and different. Um, and, but there are times when you just really have to, you know, there are times in sales where it's not a gross, it's not a huge volume play, but there are, you know, you have to get these five deals done. You just have to. And you, you just, you just have to get on the phone with them and you have to all try and get a meeting with them and whatever else. And I think I would just encourage, I mean, the amount that you learn from that process I just wish I could have done it in six months rather than uh, stretching it out, <laughs> stretching the pain out over a year or more. Um, so yeah, that'd be it. I appreciate that. And I think there's a lot to say for your first sales job being kind of in the trenches, cold calling, even though, you know, perhaps cold calling doesn't work as well as what it, it did, if at all. And there's, that's a, another conversation in itself. We won't jump into it, but be, it's a confidence thing. It's the ability to know like deep down inside you that you've got something to, of value to offer. Once you've done a couple of cold calls and you get a result from it, you stroke your ego and, and all that good stuff as well. So I think there's a lot to be said for that. And a lot of the sales consultants that come on the show, most of them um, started with the equivalent will probably be Google or someone like that now, but started with like Xerox or the kind of knocking on doors, selling photocopiers and uh, the companies had great sales training, but with difficult sales roles, they seem to have bred the current kind of 50 to 60 year old sales consultant that are doing the rounds at the moment. So I think there's a lot to that. Uh, so I appreciate that, mate. And with that, Mark, we've mentioned it a couple of times in the show, but tell us a little bit about Quilla and where we can find out more about it. Yeah. So look, Quilla is um, uh, something, it, it's amazing and it's amazing for sales i think it's something that your audience will hopefully find a lot of value out of so the basic idea is that the way we create sales collateral today is terrible uh word powerpoint pdf are these archaic tools that have you know come from the 80s and are still hanging around and all quiller is is a way for you to make those same bits of collateral as web pages um the amazing thing with embracing the web is, and look, this is as easy to do as using PowerPoint and all that sort of stuff. Um, but the amazing thing is that once you've embraced using the web, all of these things that the web can do and now, you know, that, that developers and your software team can do are now available to salespeople. So if you send out a proposal and you want to know, has it been opened? How many times? What section did they look at? Um, you can see, was it open just by one person or by multiple different people within the organization? You can have stuff like video, you can have interactive graphs and charts and embed other things that are relevant to your, to your job or product. You can do, you know, get, you know, have much better security. You also have like little, this is like a very little thing, but because it's a web page and it's live, everything is dynamic. So if I send you something and I say, I don't know, rather than dear Will Barron, I say dear Will Boron or Bill Warren or whatever, and you're like, you're like, oh no, or you've like leave the last company that you, you meant to, you know, 
find and replace the company name and you didn't do it with a file, you've sent that out and it's gone, right? It's gone. And if they want to send that on to your competitors, they can. If they want to do something else with Quiller, it's a web page. I can go on there. I can edit it, make a tiny little change. I can, you know, disable it if I want to. If I think you sent it on someone, I can put a password on there and all that sort of stuff. And all of these things are, are sort of are there and possible. And I think the, the one big one that we, that all of our sales, not all, but the vast majority of our sales people love is just websites can have buttons that do things and trigger events. And that button can be buy or accept, and it can have an e-sign thing. It can have a payment thing and it can sync with Salesforce and like other tools like that, where you can say, oh, okay, well, it's been accepted. Now go and assign this to this person. Or you can say, I'm going to pull in a hundred leads from Salesforce and, and create these personalized um, pitch decks automatically. And then when I send them out, I can actually do some customizing on the back end. So all this stuff is in the future. The future looks like the web. It doesn't look like an A4 piece of paper on, on PDF. So come and check Quiller out. We're just kick ass for proposals, quotes, presentations, pitch decks, and all that sort of stuff. Um, and yeah, it's been an awesome fun ride and, and we're, we're growing like crazy right now. So um, yeah, it's been great. Nice. And just spell out your URL just for anyone who's listening on the mobile device now so they can type it in. Yes, for sure. It's a, this is a hard one. So qwilr.com. Nice. And we'll link to that in the show note to this episode over at salesman.red, of course. We'll link to everything else that we talked about in today's show, Mark, as well. And with that, I want to thank you for giving us some quite candid answers today on today's show. You've kind of opened up and hopefully you're not going to get a load of spam emails from people wanting to join Quilla now. You might get a few uh, you know, more interesting ones kind of pitching you from the perspective that you've described and you know that's fantastic and there's there's room for a follow-up if that does happen uh so yeah i appreciate that mark and with that i want to thank you again for your time i want to thank you for joining us on the salesman podcast thanks so much will and there we have it mark thank you for taking the time out to come on the show i appreciate that appreciate your insights thank you sales nation as always for tuning in stay tuned on the next couple episodes i'm going to tease a bit more about the sales school what's coming with all of that and how I'm just genuinely <laughs> really excited about it. It's a big shift in what I'm doing. And obviously the podcast isn't going to change. That's working so well at the moment. We're getting so much feedback from you guys on all of that. But the sales school side of things is really going to supplement it. So with all that said, I'll speak with you all again on tomorrow's episode. <laughs>